welcome in this place. God are stronger. We 
We thank you that you're stronger for the one. Here in this room who is struggling with an illness, Lord, you're stronger. For the one in this room whose marriage is failing, God, you're stronger. For the one whose finances seem to be uh, more than they can keep up with, God, you're stronger. For the parent whose kids have just left them tired and worn and they're doing their best, and every day it just seems like it's just survival to get to the next day, God, you're stronger. For the past, for all the mistakes and all the failure, you're stronger. And for the one who is facing depression, God, you're stronger. And for the one who struggles with anxiety, God, you're stronger. And for the one who struggles to believe and their walk with you in this moment is more marked by doubt than anything else, God. You're stronger. A thousand times I've
worth it all. You are worth it all. Amen. Let me take a seat. As you're seated, would you scooch on in and fill up the empty chairs beside you? We have lots of folks on the sides of the wall and some of the arcade. There's plenty of seats available. Just scoot on over, make a new neighbor, make a new friend. <laughs> Welcome to Fellowship. A couple of items I want to draw to your attention on February 19th at the 11:10 hour. We will begin a 10-week class called Starting Point. This class is designed for those of us who might have some good questions and you've never had a place, a venue, an opportunity to get some good answers. Sometimes we're on our faith journey, we're not sure what we believe or why we believe what we believe, and this class is designed just for that. This is an informal setting, it's not a sales setting, it's simply for you to talk to some people about what we believe, why we believe, some of your questions, what you might believe, and wrestle through those. You can put on your program starting point and your contact information when you turn that slip in as the offering goes by, and they'll contact you about that information. Also, take the program and you have an insert today. Remember, our inserts are a way of saying a very loud announcement. Uh, this particular announcement I am thrilled to be bringing to you. February 23rd, Christopher Yuan will be speaking to our inversion audience called The Gathering. We meet here Thursday nights, but we're, we're inviting all of you. This is such a critical topic today. I've known Christopher for a number of years. He's come out of the gay lifestyle. I met him at Moody. He went on to finish his master's. He teaches adjunct faculty at Moody. He travels around the world telling his story about how he came out of homosexuality and found healing and life in Christ. This is not a political thing. It's not about civil marriages versus traditional marriage. It's just Christopher's story. There's probably not a person in this room that doesn't have a, a friend who uh, thinks they're homosexual, believes they're homosexual. You may have some uh, sexual identity questions. Come hear Christopher's story. He's a disarming speaker. He's a kind man. You will uh, be glad you came. It, it's a great presentation. Invite some people and bring them to hear this. a very vital topic in our culture. And what do Christians think? What do we believe? So I want to invite you to come and hear Christopher tell his story. Uh, for our offering prayer today, I asked Jason if he would uh, sing again the word at all. Uh, th the lyric of the song he's written to me is so profound. And when you sing a song, sometimes you just sort of you know, say the words. Engage in these lyrics as we think about steward and how we handle what God's given us. There's no riches, earthly treasures that will satisfy.
Thanks again, Jason. As part of our steward series, we wanted to bring you some stories. You've seen some on uh, video and other means, but we asked uh, Chad and Sarah Cates if they would tell you a little bit about their story and their own journey uh, dealing with their financial issues. Now, Chad and Sarah, you're, you're a musician, you're travel, you write, and Sarah, you've got a structured job at Belmont, so you're single. How do you handle money as a single person before you guys are married? I'm definitely a free spirit when it comes to finances. I didn't really worry. I did have a credit card. Um, but also, looking back, I think the thing that most strikes me about even meeting Chad was when I was single, I would give to different things. I, I think I've always had a heart to give, but I would give to a mission trip for a friend, or there wasn't any systematic approach, and I didn't tithe to, to my church that I was involved in. And even Chad, when we were dating, I saw him do that and committed to that. And really, as we, as we got married, um, that was just something we committed to from day one, and he really led me in that decision. Chad, when you were single, how did you handle your money? I have, probably have a lot of fear in, in my background when it comes to finances. I was a little more free spirit before we got married, and then I guess that the fear of money kind of when we got married kind of ramped up a little bit. <laughs> You brought some debt together, so you're married now six years, and what was your total debt when you joined it? I came in with about $15,000 in school debt, and it's probably pretty common um, uh, common mentality that you just pay the minimum on, on those school loans. And I think when, when we sat down right before we got married to figure out what, what our finances were going to be like, we signed on to Sally Mae, and she wasn't even aware of what, what she owed to Sally Mae, and we, so we signed on, and it was like, I had 15, I knew what mine was, and then it was $54,000, and I went, what? That's a lot of money. Sorry, honey. <laughs> um, when um, at some point you decided, hey, we've got to get a handle on this, what, were, what was the stimulation, the catalyst that made you get serious about getting rid of your debt? Well, probably about a year and a half ago, we went through financial peace with our, um, we were in one of the marriage mentoring groups with Greg and Pam Ham, and just have really been blessed by that group. And, um, but I, I think in community together, when we kind of started challenging each other what that looked like, um, we just really made the commitment to start hammering down that debt. And it was, I, you know, when we sat down, when we got married, it, that when we first got married and looked at that, that total amount of debt, it just looked like we were never going to get out of that debt. It just felt too big a mountain to climb. And for me, I just think it was in talking and conversations, just the what if, and that inspired us as a couple to do this together and, and dream about what God might have us do. As you started a, a plan and writing it down, what surprised you about it? Well, we, you know, there are definitely a lot of different ways to do this, and, and Dave, is, Dave Ramsey, Financial Peace is a great model to follow. I think each individual couple has to communicate and figure out what's really, what works for them. And, you know, we had an Excel sheet with tabs on it, and we did monthly budgets. So we had, you know, for six months we had budgets planned out. And um, I think for me what surprised me was as we got further into the process, and this wasn't rocket science, we put this sheet up on our refrigerator and, and it's just scribbles, but when we really started seeing how close we were to getting out of debt, it just really gave us the extra encouragement we needed to eat more rice and beans <laughs> and to really um, just continue on. It's kind of like weight loss. I mean, you can work out for a couple weeks, you don't really see anything, but that fourth week when you start feeling a difference, it encourages you to go on. We didn't really put the thing up on the refrigerator until like halfway through because, you know, you start down from $69,000 in debt and you get to 50 and you still feel like the mountain's too tall. And when we got down to about half, we started putting it on the refrigerator because we kind of thought, wow, there seems like there might could be an end to this. <laughs> so. when, uh, how much did you pay off in one year? So probably about $50,000. It kind of, like, it so surprised us how the Lord started providing. Our, our community group leaders were kind of, we watched them give away a lot of money, and it challenged us. Even in the midst of getting out of debt, the Lord prompted us to give money away. And on top of what we were giving to the church, just help out with adoptions or help out with a mission trip. And it was interesting what the, what the fear of money, how the when we started giving money away, what it did to my heart and how just fear moved to faith as we started seeing what God started doing with our money as we started being obedient. And, you know, there'd be a time at the end of the month where I would, I, 
there'd be $4,000 there and I would write the check and I didn't feel like it was, once we had made that commitment, wrote the check towards debt and kind of go, this isn't our money. You know, I didn't even feel like, oh, wow, we could go buy something with this. It was like this commitment to pay off this debt. This isn't our money. It felt holy to kind of do this because we planned to get out of debt. What's it feel like now to be out of debt? For me, looking back over the last year and a half, two years, I just really see the sovereign plan of God in our lives. And I think he uses exercises of discipline, which this was that for us to really move us to a different place in our faith walk. And it is, has increased our capacity as a couple and as individuals. Um, it's increased our faith and it's helped in our decision-making process and, and not just with finances, but I'll tell you a quick story. Um, for the last four years, we wanted to have a child and that just hasn't worked out for us. So um, about a year and a half, two years ago, we started doing some fertility treatment. That didn't work out for us. Um, and so we started talking about and, adoption. And the fertility treatment was in, in the budget, in the budget. <laughs> by the way, um, in each month in the tab that we were going to do it. But, um, you know, we started meeting with some of the pastors at church here this summer about adoption and just exploring that option. And my heart really wasn't fully there yet to just grasp that. But um, the, the Lord's been working on us for the last year and a half with tons of big decisions. And we got a call this last week from a friend and said, there's a baby that's going to be born in three weeks. Are you open to this? And my heart leapt when I got the call. Uh. <laughs> and he kind of did that. <laughs> now, where, um, where were you when it happened? Tell okay, me. I was at a lunch meeting, and we were at the, the hostess stand going up. In the, and I hadn't met. I, I knew one of the guys. I, I didn't know the other guy. So it was kind of, I took this phone call, and she goes, would you take a baby in three weeks? And I went, uh. <laughs> Yes, yes. I'll call you back. I can't talk now, but yes. And so within a split second, we both jumped right in. And I just think it's how the Lord has grown us through this exercise of discipline to really say, okay, Chad, Sarah, I'm going to throw opportunities your way. And how are you going to steward these opportunities that I give you? And to approach them out of faith and not fear. And it's just something that I've seen him do with a lot of decisions that he's been making and us do as a couple, uh, which has been really encouraging to watch. We told this story last night and failed to say someone else is adopting this baby. We, Praise God. Yeah, the baby's yeah, good. The baby's good. We, we didn't get the, the opportunity to adopt this baby, but we're making steps toward adoption, and it just really solidified our heart that way. So, What's the biggest lesson you've learned in this whole process? For me, Dave Ramsey talked about this last week, why we do something. And I, I think that that's something we started dreaming about early on when we started thinking about getting out of, out of debt was what might God do through us for his kingdom if we didn't make decisions based on how much money we did or didn't have. Um, and just really, I would encourage everyone to really dig into why are you doing this? And there needs to be a bigger why than just you. Mm -hmm. And when you recognize that, I don't think you can deny not taking this step of discipline. Chad, we've got a picture of a check up here. Tell us a little bit about that as you... Okay, I just want to say, you know, Dave Ramsey said, you can do this. I, if we can do this, you can do this. And the last check you pay off for debt is so worth it. <laughs> I, so I paid off a chunk and realized that we overpaid Sally May by about a dollar and a half, something like that. <laughs> Sally and owes us. Sally owes us money, which was a good check to get, a really good check. So, so. Well, I'm, I'm hopeful God's going to provide that baby in some way, shape, or form. I'm sure he will. So would you thank Chad and Sarah? Open your Bible to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. We are today concluding the five-part steward series. Uh, as we began this series, we end it. There's no big ask at the end. We're not uh, building a building or trying to do some project. This is simply to talk about stewardship at a high level and try to encourage as many people as possible to, to get serious about how we're using these resources. Chapter 16 of Luke is perhaps one of the most extraordinary passages in the entire gospel. Uh, for those of you who are songwriters or you write or you just like to read good literature, this is an extravagant, an elaborate, a detailed story that is almost impossible to communicate in 
less than 30 minutes. Um, we've talked before about a chiastic device, A, A prime, B, B prime, C, C prime, and D, for example. And the point is A and A prime are similar concepts and so forth, and D is the point in the middle. Uh, there are big chiasms, little chiasms, all through this uh, section of the Gospel of Luke that are so poignant, so powerful. And so as you, as you read it in English, you have to study a little bit. It's good for you to study. And you can begin to see, especially those who like to read literature, how the Spirit of God crafted this story through the pen of Luke, the words of our Savior. The, the story is complicated. We have an unjust, unrighteous, dishonest steward whom the master praises. And so if you read commentaries or study this passage, you will be scratching your head going, how can the master be praising, commending a steward who squandered money, who was dishonest, and how does he applaud him for what he has done? When we read the Bible, it's ever important to always go back as best we can to put ourselves in the context which the story was written or told. We talk about uh, in the first century, the ear of the first century listener in, in the Old Testament. What was the Old Testament person hearing? And we've got to do a bit of that this morning to get a good picture of this passage. Otherwise, it frankly is very difficult to understand. His primary audience is the disciples. The disciples are not here just the twelve, but a large group that's following him. As with all these stories, there's a primary audience, but there are eavesdroppers and those who are nearby. Technically, the story is still being used to teach this moment. We're still eavesdropping on a story that Jesus told 2,000 plus years ago when he was explaining this to his disciples as a way of an illustration. Parables we have to be careful with not to push them too far. One of the problems we get into is over analytically looking at a parable. At the same time we want to look at the complexity and the, and the structure and the language to see what the big meaning is. I've often said no one shed a tear over a propositional truth. Jesus could have simply said, be wise in the way you handle money. Next subject. But that goes nowhere. So he tells a story that grabs the heart and the head of the listener. And for the first century believer, the first century audience, it's going to be full of twists and turns. A parable is something everybody understood. A man was going on a journey. There was a man who went up to the temple complex. A man had some land. Everybody gets the context or the parable fails. So the parable that Jesus is making up is a story that everybody will understand, but the master storyteller puts twists and turns that make the listener lean in a little more, crane his ear a little more. What's happening with this story? This isn't the way these things work. Let's look at the three characters, the rich man, the steward and the debtors. First of all, the first two verses, we get the master, the, ma the manager, and his mishandling. So we get the setting in verses 1 and 2. Now he was also saying to his disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager, and his manager was reported to him as squandering his possessions. And he called him and said to him, what is this I hear about you? Give an accounting of your management for you can no longer be manager. At the high level, everything in the story, the master is a good moral person. There's no smudge on the master. He's not a wicked overlord. He's a good master. The manager who works for him here is the word okonomos, okonomos. That's the Greek word we bring into English, economy. An economos was a steward over other employees, a steward over an estate. He could be a public official. The main point of a steward's job was he was managing and representing something that was not his. He is managing and representing something that is not his. He's given control over it, but he doesn't own it. And that is important to keep as we look at the passage. Now, the master asked him, what is this I hear about you? And the way the verbs flow in this verse, it means, I keep hearing this thing about you. This isn't a one-time occasion. What is this I keep hearing about you? Both the word reported and squandering are, are loaded words. The word reported is an idea of an allegation with hostile intent. I've heard this about you. 
that you're squandering my possessions. Squandering is also used of the so-called prodigal in the chapter before, Luke 15, when the uh, younger son insults his father by saying, I wish you were dead, par parenthetically, give me my inheritance. And then he squanders it on loose living. Same word. It means to waste money. It means to lose and spend and waste money frivolously. When I was in college, I had a roommate who, the, the day he was born, his grandparents invested in stock for him. His graduation present was turning that stock over to him on his graduation day. He went out and squandered that money in about three weeks. I'll never forget it as long as I live. I was working two part-time jobs. I couldn't buy a student loan. They wouldn't give you loans in those days. Play the violins, please. I'm working hard. I'm going to school, paying my way, and I see him get this big fat check, and he blows it on stuff and living. He squandered. You are misusing, the master says, my money. Give an account of this. Now, we're not told how he squandered it. Again, the parable is not, that's not the point. Did he take kickbacks under the table? Did he bribe the renters? We don't know. That's not the point of the story. The parable is simply saying he's mishandling the master's money. He's supposed to handle and represent well the master's money, and he's doing the exact opposite. Now, in the first century, what they would be waiting for is he's fired. Long before Donald Trump said it. What they're waiting for is, you fire him. And so the first twist and turn in the parable is that, number one, he doesn't tank the guy. And number two, the steward is silent. Now, the Mishnah is a commentary on the Torah. The Torah are the first five books of your Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Also known as the Pentateuch, five. That is pretty much the Jewish Bible, if you will. That's what you see in the scrolls. The Mishnah is a running commentary on the Torah. So different rabbis wrote different opinions. Think of it like case law or like an encyclopedia. And they wrote different articles and commentary on parts of the law. Are you with me? So the Mishnah is not a document like the Bible. It's a commentary about Old Testament views. Listen to what George Horowitz, a Mishnah scholar, writes when he looks at this passage. The appointment and power of the agent may be revoked at any time. In other words, the master who's employing the steward, he can take that away at any time with or without good cause. Whatever the agent does after the revocation is not binding. So if the steward's fired and he goes and does something and he's fired, it doesn't matter. He doesn't have the authority to do that. Horowitz continues, it takes effect, however, only from the time that it is brought home to the agent or person with whom he's dealing. Now, it's a little bit cumbersome, but what he's saying is there is a window of opportunity for this steward. And part of the twist and turn of the story is he's not fired on the spot. So there's this little window, and the, and the listener's going, he didn't fire him? And the second thing the listener doesn't get is there's no argument. Because in the first century, between two Jews, you would expect a loud debate. If you don't believe me, go to Israel with me. You see two bus drivers pull up at the same intersection at the same time, you're going to see some fireworks. They get real animated with each other. It's real exciting to watch from the safety of your seat. I remember a number of times when these guys are in each other's face, just yelling and screaming. You know, how, you know how preachers, when we preach, we spit sometimes, you know, inadvertently a little spittle comes out, you know. I do it. Lloyd, Lloyd's really good at it too. Um, good preachers spit. That's the mark of a good preacher. Um, well, you get in this zone where these two Israelis are fighting, arguing about some principle. There's some spittle going on. And the parable is offsetting on two points. He wasn't fired and the steward's silent. Now the listener's on the edge of his or her seat. Wait a minute. This isn't how it works. You fire him on the spot, and he argues and defends. I didn't do anything wrong. I'll prove it. You can't fire me. None of that's recorded in the story. Jesus has got him drawn in to the storyline. Let's look at the shrewd steward, verses 3 through 7. The manager said to himself, What shall I do, since my master is taking the management away from me? I am not strong enough to dig. I am ashamed to beg. 
I know what I shall do, so that when I am removed from the management, people will welcome me into their homes. And he summoned each one of his master's debtors, and then he began saying to the first, How much do you owe my master? And he said, A hundred measures of oil. And he said to him, Take your bill and sit down quickly and write fifty. Then he said to another, And how much do you owe? And he said, A hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, Take your bill and write eighty. Now the manager is in crisis. There's no future for him unless he acts very quickly. Look at some of the questions. Number one, you got to love what Jesus does in verse 3. The master said to himself, think about this. Jesus is making up a story to make a point. And with embedded in the story, it's so compelling and twist and turns, and now you have a solilo soliloquy. The master said to him, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? He had a little window of time. He's got to be quick about it. And the first thing he says is, I can't dig. Now, this does not mean it's beneath him. It means he's physically unable to do the work. He's a white collar, uh, you know, no calloused hand managerial type. He can't do the work of a laborer. We might make the analogy, if you lost your job as an executive, you can't run a backhoe for a construction company. You don't have the skill set, the physical ability to do that as quickly and as well as someone who's proficient at that level. It's not as though he's unwilling to take a job below him. He's unable. So when you're fired from your job, it's not that you can't find work. A very different mindset by today's standards. Well, I'm not going to do that job. It's beneath me. No, that's not what he's saying at all. I can't do that job. Secondly, he says, I can't beg. I'm ashamed to beg. Begging in the first century is different than we think about it today. If you're a beggar in the first century, you are either a disabled person or a person with such a, a bad character that no one will hire you. So he's got some pride and a little nobility left in him. And he says, I can't dig. I don't have the physical ability. I'm not going to turn into a beggar. It's a dishonorable lifestyle. So he comes up with a pragmatic solution to his quandary. Now, notice in the text, he says... Look, look at your passage. What shall I do? Verse 3. And then verse 4. I know what I will do. Why? Here's the purpose of what his plan is. So that when I am removed, when that is now public that he's lost his job, other people will welcome me into their homes. The shrewd steward goes to work. No one yet knows he's fired. So when he's removed, he'll have favor with the people. Now, the debtors in the story can take on a couple of possibilities. I personally don't think Jesus is telling a parable about a Jewish landowner who lent money to people. It would go against the law. Now, you could lend, but you did it without usury. More than likely, the master is a landowner because that would be common again in the first century. More than likely, these were like sharecroppers who one of them took care of the olive orchard, let's say, and all of his crew, and the other one took care of, let's say, wheat that was, that was then turned in for grain for animals and food for people to buy. So those are the two illustrations we have. Everybody would understand olive oil. Everyone would understand grain. That was part of the lingua franca. Everyone got it, a story they all knew. So he goes to these individuals, and he says, what do you owe my master? And he reduces the first one in half and the second one by about 25%. The amount is not as important as what he does. Take the bill quickly and write. What's significant is the steward can't sign for the man who's renting the property. The guy who's renting has to sign. When you buy a house, the bank doesn't sign for you. You sign for it. Why? Because if you fail to make the payment, you signed here, you have to make the payment or we take the house away. So these guys are renting, if you will, the rights to work the orchards, the rights to grow the crops, and a percentage of that goes back to the landowner as payment. You follow me? That's how they make their living. The landowner's got all this land. He can't utilize it. There's olive orchards. There's grain area that can be grown. Let people grow the grain. Let them take care of the orchards. You give me a percentage of your, well, of, of your produce, and you can live off the rest. That's a simple story. I think it fits best with the context, and Jesus is not talking about layers upon layers of problems here. The steward brings that debtor in and says, right on the bill. Now, 
If you got a call from the bank tomorrow morning and said the balance on your home is $427,000 and change, if you come in today at 10 o'clock, I got a new rate for you, I can adjust this down to $265,000, what would you say? I'll be there early, right? And then what would you do? You would tell your husband or your wife or your friends or people that you work with, you'd be having a party. And the fact that he does it with his hand, there's a very interesting uh, scholar who believes, whether it was Hebrew or Aramaic or Greek, is a big, uh, not Greek of course, debate, how these contracts were written, let's just say Hebrew. Think of the number six in the way we think. You can turn it into an eight real easily, couldn't you? And there's some that have gone to the, to the nth degree to analyze these amounts and say by the stroke of just a pen like making a six into an eight let's say illustration you could change the amount do it in your hand in other words so that when the master gets the books well that's what the books say so the master is in a quandary now the steward is acting on behalf of the master if the renters know the steward has been fired they're complicit in fraud because the steward does not have the authority to do what he's doing. Look at the master's condemnation of it, verse 8. His master praised the unrighteous manager because he acted shrewdly. For the sons of this age are more shrewd in relation to their own kind than the sons of light. Is the master praising the lie and the deceit of the steward? If so, we have a problem. Most Bible commentators take it that way. Most Bible students take it that way. But there's really a very good explanation if you understand the context and the way the first century person would hear this story. The master's got two choices. Number one, he can go in and can explain it to these debtors that my steward acted without my authority. I'd already fired him and uh, you, you owe me that money back. You owe me that measure of wheat. You owe me that measure of oil still. What's going to happen to his reputation? He had an unrighteous steward. He had a man representing him that was falsifying information. That looks bad on him. Secondly, in a communal lifestyle of a tribe, everybody's heard about how great this master is, that he's given his renters a break. The master's gone up in value from the commoner. The master's going to lose some money, sure, but at the, in the bigger level, what's going to happen if he goes after those people and says, no, my steward didn't have that authority? On the other hand, if the master keeps quiet, what happens? Everybody wins except him. The debtors win, and they're happy, and they love the master. And do you think they're going to continue renting from the master and making money for him? Absolutely. If he keeps quiet, the steward gets off, quote unquote, scot-free. And then his resolve is, I'll be welcomed into their home. Translation, I'll be able to get a job. Because if they fire me as a steward, I'm unemployable. I can't physically work that hard as a laborer. I, I don't want to beg. What am I going to do? So he comes up with this plan. The word shrewd in our Bible probably has a relationship to the primary root of wisdom in the Old Testament. Wisdom in the Old Testament is a huge concept, but it simply means, or in broad strokes means, that you're walking in a pattern of wise decision making. Always juxtaposed against the righteous and the unrighteous. The way of the wicked is one way, the way of the righteous is another way. And on the story goes throughout all the wisdom literature of Proverbs, part of the Psalms, Song of Solomon, part of Job. Wisdom literature is you're making, you're walking in a series of wise decisions, avoiding unrighteousness and following righteousness as you make those decisions. I believe what Jesus is saying here as the role of the master is, he's not praising the guy's deception. He's praising that he was wise. Look at verse 8. In relation to the sons of the age, rather than the way the sons of the light deal with one another. So it's a, it, I mean, it takes a little bit of looking. The parable saying the steward risks everything on the reputation of his master. Because the steward knows his master is a kind man a forgiving man, a good man. The steward knows more about, quote, God than the average Christian knows about God because the steward knows God's a forgiving God. The steward knows his master will keep his mouth shut 
and will take it on the chin. He'll take the loss for his reputation and he's got to sort of wink at the guy going, you know what, he was wise in the world standards to pull that off. Good for him. Perhaps not one-to-one, -one, but the literature is the concept of from the light to the heavy. Or to put it in simple terms, how many of you saw Butch Cassidy in the Sundance Kid? How many of you wanted Butch Cassidy in the Sundance Kid to get away? You want them to win. You want them to get away from the evil Mexicans who are killing them. You, I mean, never mind they've robbed banks and killed people. You want them to get away. A more common analogy perhaps is Ocean's Eleven. 12, 13, 14, 15. <laughs> we, we, we want them to pull it off. We want the con to work. Get, get, get the bad, evil casino owner. The little thieves win over the bad, big, billionaire casino owner, right? It's the light to the heavy is the structural principle of it. And there's that going on in this story here. And the audience is going, that steward was so shrewd. And Jesus turns the notch and says, they're more shrewd in the world than you are as believers. And that's the aha. They're more shrewd, they're wiser in the ways of the world than the believer is. And if you're going to be my steward, you've got to be wise in the way you deal with the kingdom of God and knowing that your Father will forgive you. That your father's character is just and merciful always. That your father's reputation is important and reflected in you as his steward. Makes a whole lot more sense than praising a guy who did a bad thing. If you look at it through those lenses. Well, we're going to go back in Luke and then come forward again. And we will get to the next passage. But I want to just give you a bit of a forecast. We don't have time to unpack the poem, but I want to read the last part, which asks the question, are we faithful or unrighteous? Let me read verses 9 to the end of the section. And I say to you, make friends for yourselves by means of wealth of unrighteousness, so that when it fails, will you underline when in your Bible? When it fails, they will receive you into eternal dwellings. He who is faithful in a very little thing is also faithful in much. But he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the use of unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you true riches? And if you've not been faithful in the use of that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot love God and wealth or God and mammon. And we'll exposit that in more detail. It's another extraordinary piece of literature to show you. Let me give you some concluding lessons on the big picture of the Steward series, hopefully to encourage all of us as we think about our lives as stewards of what God's entrusted. Number one, a steward is focused on eternality, not just temporalness. We're focused on the future, our life with Christ, not just now. A steward has to think beyond. Sarah brought it out. Dave brought it out last week. Why? It's a big question. Just to get out of debt? Just to make more money? Just to do this? Just to buy a bigger, better, new, more? Those are insufficient whys to catapult you all your life. And if you get a little bit of the story that the world's pretty smart the way it conducts business dealings. Are we as smart as believers in Christ that we're leveraging our stewardship for the kingdom of God based on his reputation, representing the master, controlling what the master gives us? We are a reflection of him. We're signing in his name, if you will. We're handling our lives in his name, if you will. And that's the wisdom he wants for you and me. Secondly, a steward manages what's entrusted to him. Your job and mine is to handle what we have. It's the, it's the old cliche, there's no U-Hauls behind hearses. You're not going to take it somewhere. They're going to put you in a box that might cost a few thousand or lots of thousands of dollars. They'll put you in a box in the ground, you're going to turn to dust. And if they put jewelry in there with you, it's just going to sit in the ground. You cannot take it with you. So it's a temporal thing that we have to have 
open-handedly. What's the axiom? If it's too good to loan, it's coo too good to own. I hate that axiom. There's some things I don't want to loan to people, much less my children. I'm selfish. A steward manages, doesn't own. We're always stewards, never owners. Thirdly, God is very interested in our handling of money. Money is not just this old small thing, by the way. Christ talks about money more than he talks about sin. Money is a reflection, as the poem at the end says, of where our heart is. And he's extraordinarily interested in how you use what you have. I learned a principle years ago to live under my income. Long before there was financial peace and these kinds of tools, there was master your money. Later on there was crown and each of these things has a life that's it's helpful for a season, and they were helpful to Cindy and me. And just the concept of living under my income, what a novel idea. See, if I have to borrow money from someone or some bank to get something, that means I don't have enough money to get what I want. If somebody co-signs for me, not only do I have enough money, they don't have enough sense not to sign it. I don't have enough money, and they're on the hook for me not having enough money. I mean, think of the logic of this. So to live under your income is a principle that you need to start at some point. You're not there now, fine. Don't feel guilt and, and discouragement today. Feel hope and, and anticipation. Just like Chad and Sarah, you can get there. And it's not just the money, it's the steward's heart. Four, materialism and consumerism have to be evaluated carefully, but not compared to others. Consumerism and materialism has to be evaluated carefully. We are a consuming society. Obviously, we eat groceries, but we also consume goods. And when goods wear out, when clothes wear out, shoes wear out, air conditioners wear out, we're a consumer-oriented society. But look at your consumption. What are you eating in life? And look at materialism, which is where you spend most of the time is probably what you worship. You spend most of your time at work and managing your wealth and managing your property. I remember driving to, years ago when I would drive in uh, Texas, when I would drive to church early on Sunday morning, people would be in their yards on those little insulite kneelers, those yard pads, weeding their yards. And their, I thought they're worshiping at their yard. They're on their, as close to worship as they're going to get. They're kneeling in their yards doing yard work on Sunday morning, the, the people that run in my neighborhood, every Sunday morning there's some rain, shine, cold, whatever, they're out there running, and I don't know what their lives are, but it's where you spend your time is what you worship. And a steward has to evaluate that, but you do not compare yourself to somebody else. There will always be someone that makes more than you or me. Funny, we never compare ourselves to people that live less with less and with a different contentment. We always compare ourselves to people that have bigger, better, newer, more, don't we? I never compare myself to someone who's driving a junker and lives in a crummy neighborhood and maybe doesn't have a very good job. I don't compare myself to those people. It's my own sin. I compare myself to someone with bigger, better, newer, more, probably like you. And that's where the heart's got to stop. Say, wait a minute. It's how I use what God's given me, not how someone else uses what God's given them. I'm not to play police on this. Five, give first. And I believe Scripture teaches that you give first of your first fruit. It is two things, an act of worship and a statement of faith. If I give first, I'm worshiping God, and I'm living by faith. In the Old Testament, it was the firstborn. It was the first crop, the first harvest of the great. Well, think about that. You've worked all season long to get that crop, and you've got to give the first of it to God? Kind of dicey, kind of risky. What if you've got a whole bunch of lambs that are, that are they're pregnant, and the first one is perfect. It's a boy. You have to give it to the Lord. You don't know if those 20 or 30 lambs will be born healthy or half of them will die. It's a statement of worship and a statement of faith because God's just giving it to us to use. We don't own it. So as a statement of worship, do I trust him with the first fruit or do I trust him with the... And, and why did Paul say, take your giving at the first of the week? Because the end of the week comes for all of us like the end of the month. And then we don't do it. So for us, it's a statement of faith and worship. Six, increase your giving before your standard of living. 
Cindy and I have adopted this early in our married life, and I'm here to tell you, along with living under your income, with giving first, with saving a little bit, 529s for our kids, getting your emergency thing, all these things that Dave and Crown and many resources talk about, most of them are pretty straightforward common sense. If you live this way for a long time, it works. It really works. We made the decision. Uh, we, we in seminary and graduate school, we were giving like $50 a month. And we didn't have that to give. But it wasn't 10%, I can assure you. It might have been 3 or 4%, 2%, I don't know. And then as we got a little more stable and normal in life and had a real job, we went to 10% pretty quickly. And it was hard. But we said as an act of worship and an act of faith, we're going to give at least 10%. You know, the tithe in the Old Testament is technically 22.5%. If you add up the tenth and the free will offerings and the guilt offerings and all the other offerings, you can argue very strongly it was at least 22 to 22.5% of what the average Jewish Israelite would have in his or her possession. The New Testament doesn't speak specifically of a tithe, but it does speak of giving out of grace. Grace sounds to me like more than a tenth. So Cindy and I adopted a principle that we would increase our giving before our standard of living. And for us over the years, it was 1% and then 2% and then 3% above the 10 each time we got a raise. And to this day, we get a check we didn't see coming. First thing we do is say, how much are we going to give where? And if you've never been there, I've got to tell you, it's, it's fun. It's free. It's a kick in the pants. When you've got under your income, you've got some money in the bank, you've got the kids thing, kind of, you know, the trajectory for them to get through college, you got the savings, you got the, all that stuff taken care of. You're not managing credit card debt, you're paying your bills off on time every month, you're out of debt. When you've got cash in your hand, it's a fun thing. And we're fortunate and blessed, as many of you are, to have a marriage that we like to give. We've been working at it for 31 years. Didn't happen overnight. And I know something, well, you're, you're bragging. You're, you're, you're bragging what you're doing. No, I'm not. I'm telling you, we follow God at his word, and God's word's true. And God's reliable. And if you live under your income, and you give first as an act of worship, and you save, and you do these things over time, it does work. He's extraordinarily kind as a master. And this story, if it tells us nothing else, he asked the question in the poem, do you love God or do you love money? A question for all of us. But he's a kind manager. Kind master. He's not, as Dave often says, he's not mad at you. I like that. He's not mad at you. He loves you. But he also wants you to be free from worry and fear about stuff. Because we have enough to be concerned about, much less that. Father in heaven, thank you for these men and women. I pray that you'd encourage each of them in their walk with you as a steward to be on guard against materialism, to be free from worry as they give and trust and balance their life with you, to look forward to your return, to have a big enough question of why we're doing this that motivates us beyond just a goal of getting out of debt or saving certain money. And that at the end of the day, we will be found faithful. You've asked us not to be successful, but to be faithful. And I pray for each one of us that it will change this church and this culture and middle Tennessee for Christ. Because men and women become extraordinary stewards of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In your name I ask and pray. Amen. Have a great week. God bless you.